another episode of The World Beyond Belief. This is episode 137, After the Verdict in Hampstead and the Next Logical Steps. I'm your co-host, Mindy Erkin, and with me today, as always, is your host, Paul Marco. Hi, and welcome to another edition of World Beyond Belief. It's great to have you here. We've had some really good response to... uh, some of the things that we've done on the Hempstead case so far, and we're going to stay on it uh, because I think we've got them, uh, I think we've got the Satanists in a very uncomfortable position, and if we can stay on it and move forward, I think we might really gain some ground. I heard a uh, quotation last night that I thought really applies to what we're going to talk about today. It goes, There's only one truth, but a thousand lies to cover it. But every truth uncovers a thousand lies. This has been an ongoing struggle in the UK and around the world. The satanic child abuse, child torture, child murder rings that are all over the world. And... I think that uncovering them and knowing about them is going to wake a lot of people up and also make them have to change how they do business. Unfortunately, I think in the beginning it won't be a pleasant change for us because it'll probably be in the direction of more violence. But maybe we have to get through this to get to the next step. Today we're going to, we're going to bring you up to date on everything that that I saw and I know that's gone on on the case so far. And also explore another way to look at this thing. Another way that gives us a lot more empowerment and gives us a lot more strength and gives us a lot more things to do and reasons to do it. And then we're going to go into some of the things we might be able to do in our situation right now, which seems on the surface to be kind of powerless, but it's really not if you look into it. Well, since we've been on the air talking about this topic, the verdict has come out. Judge Poffley has reached a verdict which basically exonerates all the Satanists and all the people involved in that cult. Actually, it never investigated it at all. It seemed to discard the medical evidence on the two children that were examined and decided to place the blame on Ella Draper, who was the mother, who did everything right, called the police, tried to get some action in the case, and her mate, Abraham Christie. For those of you who aren't familiar with the case, Let me play a short clip of an interview. Now, this interview is with Sabine McNeil. Now, Sabine is an advocate for uh, child protection, and she gets involved in many of these cases. I've seen a tape of her addressing the United Nations about this same issue. Uh, Let me play an interview with her and Richie Allen. The interview is done by Richie Allen, and I think it brings you up to date kind of on the the background of the situation. But before we do, I really want to mention the scope of this problem. Supposedly, a child is reported missing every three minutes in the UK. Some people estimate that as many as 100,000 children per month are abducted. And that's in the UK. Now, this is a worldwide problem. UK is a small country. I would imagine there's even more in the United States and more in Canada and more in Australia, everywhere that's ruled by the satanic elite, which is everywhere on the planet. Just wanted to give you a hint as to how big this problem is and how important it is. Okay, now let's go with to Richie and Sabine McNeil. Sabine, do you know what? For people tuning into this and hearing this for the first time, do you want to start at the very beginning? When did you hear from the mother of these young children. When did she first contact you and what did she November, tell you? In November last year, she phoned me and uh, sent me a few emails and then she came around. And even though I 
basically didn't want to, I cannot cope with individual cases anymore. I just knew I had to take this one on because nobody else could and would. It's yes. too big, too complex, too shocking. And I have had to go through a lot of what I call shock therapy myself to get to where I got to with the exposure of forced adoptions in Brussels. But now to add, I mean, organized sex abuse in a Hampstead school with including a shop round the corner from me. I mean, excuse me. I, it's just, it was even for me too much. But when I saw the videos, it was credible. I had, show, I had sent some information to a friend and he said, it can't be true. I sent him a link to the videos and he said, the children are credible. I was, I'm really glad the way you introduced it, to this talking about veracity and, and validity. And I actually sent an email to John Hemming MP um, reasonably, what, not too long ago, I mean, two, three, four weeks where I feel that the degree of cover-up is now proof of the veracity of what the children are saying. And by the way, there was a comment on a YouTube video where a parent from Hampstead also confirmed what the children are saying. Sabine, without mentioning the name of the school, without mentioning anybody's name, remind our listeners of what the children claimed in the videos. The children's videos were first of all recorded at the end of their holidays and a day or so after they had been interviewed by the police. Now, what is, in my view, incredibly important with respect to the veracity is the consistency with which both the girl and the boy are talking independently and during the various times at which they are reporting. What are they reporting? The fact that they do sex to us. So who are they and how often? Well, on the petition that I published, I start with a quote saying, my dad lies to my mum because he doesn't see us only every other Saturday. He sees us every single day in school. So the children said that 20 special children are included and uh, involved. That includes also their parents. And it has become very clear that parents have been approached uh, to be part of this, what has to be called a cult. And um, what they are doing in this cult is not only abusing the children um, with plastic willies and real willies, um, but they are also going as far as... I, I... No, I don't want to talk about it now. They said murder, didn't they, in the videos? Pardon? They said murder, didn't they? In the in it the video, they murder. Talked about murder yeah. The the person who was who published the first email that I had sent to the Home Secretary, he said he right that he thought that murder was illegal and against the law, and I'm supposed to be treated like a criminal by the police. I can't go back. And I was going to get to that because in, in the introduction I didn't mention what this has um, caused for you, your involvement in this, because um, you've had to leave the country. Yes, because at 8 o'clock in the morning, my friend Belinda, with whom we are doing all of this, she had already read an email from the mother. The local Three local authorities wanted to get together to mount a prosecution against me. And uh, my computer was a bit stuffy and hung up and so I couldn't get around to it but I managed I booked at least a flight and packed a suitcase and left because I know you know my most popular website is called victimsunite.net and um, uh, I know from enough prisoners what what is happening how is hap how they are being tr mistreated and how it's like with the children once they've got control over you, you just can't get away from them, whether it's social services and children, like the, the boy and girl we are talking about, or whether it is prisoners. They, I mean, it, it's as if people are paid to be cruel.
it's horrible. It's it's terrible. Can 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 we um can we get a timeline going for for listeners again who want to know the timeline? So the mum contacted you, and you um what advice did you give the mum then when she contacted you for help? Well, there was not much in terms of advice as such. We you know I just listened and what is worth doing. At the po- at that time, she had to face a hearing in the family court in Barnet. And, because, uh, because she made the videos? No, 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 no. Because the, uh, um, because the local authority automatically got uh, into court proceedings and had to have the, the, the key question was always, who abused the children and who is able to parent them? Which is completely ridiculous, you see, because the uh, uh, at that point the mother had uh, dismissed two solicitors, and on that hearing she also dismissed her barrister. Because we, as Mackenzie friends, just know that they don't operate and work in the interest of their clients. They just take the money from legal aid and and do whatever they do. I mean, now there's one barrister who actually fled the country herself with her two daughters, and she said, we are professional losers. And she said in 11 years, she hadn't had any child back. Now, that's not the case with Ian Josephs, who's been um, advising parents for 50 years. And he says he gets about 25% uh, children back. Uh, so I didn't do it, give any advice. I mean, I just helped and helped and helped. I helped with my connections, my friends, and I helped with making documents and just, you know, from day to day to day. And in particular, that hearing, I think it made a difference that we were there as a, you know, a little, a little bit of a force, nine, ten or so people all together. And um, so so Mackenzie friends were suddenly on the map and the mother wasn't on alone and just kind of, in, in victim of the whole system because it, unfortunately this is the the, the problem. So the, so the so the children were taken away because the state suspects that they were abused, but yet the state is no, not. No, 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 no. The state, the state needed to look at, to hold on to the children because they were just far too precious uh, victims. I mean, hey, the the police had recorded their interviews, the police knew that the children knew yeah. about the victims and that the, the police, uh, the, the children named police as well, the, that they knew that the, I mean. They named they, a lot of people, didn't they? They named, the they, they, go, they named but, other parents, they named police officers, they, they named teachers. But surely when the state comes to, and I've had Ian Josephs on this program, by the way, he's a terrific man, I have a lot of time for him. Um, uh, Sabine, but when they came to take the children, they must give a reason, there must be a reason given as to why we're taking the children away. What did they say? What is the reason for the children being in custody? The official reason? Um, I would have to, they, they, they issued what is called a, an emergency police protection order and I would have to go back to the document, but they they talk about they talk about section thirty one threshold uh, risk of future emotional harm is always the the, the, the risk standard. of future emotional harm. That's right. Yeah, that's what we got into and, with the and, and in fact, that's that is one of the issues that the mother has addressed in the submissions, both in the family court and in the high court, because the, there were two hearings that we got were involved then in the family court, and then on and just before. Christmas, the uh, Judge Vera Mayer then transferred the case to the High Court, and in the High Court, the judge didn't address it either. The reasons for why why the local authority think they have the right to keep hold on to the children, and you know, because the other terrible thing is, besides the if you like invalidity of the the the, uh, the council taking the children is the utter hypocrisy it's always supposed to be in the best in their best interest they were taken on september 11th 6 days later they were recorded with videos where to have retracted the, those this, their allegations and accusations of that they had made twice first on september 5th and secondly on september 11th on september 17th they retracted Supposedly, the Mask of Zorro, the film was blamed. 
So it completely... They blamed the mask of Zorro uh, as as stimulating the children's imagination to make up a story like that. Yes. Ah, Jesus Christ, Sabine. Who'd believe that? Well, believe uh, that? They, they clearly want us to believe it, but it's 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 so much worse, you know, Richie. It has so many different aspects to it, because I know. I mean, I, uh, that on uh, so on September 9th there was a strategy meeting where they decided basically to take the children and to frame the mother and her then partner. So they found the perfect scapegoat. And for God forbid, the father, the criminal father himself, which is the other big issue. You see, the mother had suffered domestic violence from him with five police call outs, three reports. He only had contact twice a month. There was a residence order in place for her to look after the children. And there had been two non-molestation orders, are they called, as they're called, against him as well. Well, would the judge deal with the non-molestation order? We went, in terms of advice, we went to the little court in Iowan, and there the judge told us, no, sorry, there are, these are ongoing procedures, so you have to talk to the high court judge. Well, did she address it? No. The issues are, on what grounds do the, does the council hold the children? Zilch. Why does the father have more contact than the mother? Excuse me, what kind of logic is that? And why doesn't she issue a non molestation order? Why does the father manage to get a laptop to the children and have Skype conversation in addition to the contact? I mean, if this isn't all an utter protection of the criminal father and his associates, and the mother had, has compiled a list of 60, 70 abusers who are, and, and adults who are all in it together with him. That's an interview. Uh, with Sabine McNeil and Richie Allen. He's on Volcano Radio, and you that's available on YouTube, that whole interview. And if you're interested in the case, which I hope you are, go and listen to the whole interview because there is more information. I wanted to get some to some other things in this broadcast, though. Let me first of all tell you that because of the judge's order and because of the way the courts, I suppose, are viewing this thing, that there's a warrant out for Sabine McNeil's arrest, for the arrest of Ella um, Draper and her uh, boyfriend, her partner, uh, Abraham Christie. So that's happening. The whole thing was inverted. Judge Poffrey made the determination without any representation from the mother, um, without taking into account, obviously, the medical evidence, or if she did take it into account, she assumed it was Abraham Christie who was violating these children, which how could that be the case? They were the ones that turned them in. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. No investigation of the, story, of the children's story was done. Zilch. The children gave detailed descriptions of the location, the bodies of the people who were molesting them, Nothing was done to investigate that at all. Instead, the child's statements were whitewashed, and somehow they were, I think, forced to retract them later. And then, get this, those retractions were made public on YouTube. Those are official police investigations. How could that have happened if this wasn't part of a whitewash? And also, they, they conveniently switched the blame away from the Satanists, away from the people who were perpetuating this thing, and put it on the mother and the mother's partner. So it's crazy. And I think there's a lot of people in the UK that really feel that it's crazy also because everybody's waking up to this. I think everybody's waking up to this. Let's go to a, a quick snippet from the UK column where they react initially react to the verdict. This is the UK column. Well, we're going to move south of the border, and uh, this is uh, one of a number of headlines which I'm going to describe as horrific. It's the Mail reporting on the abuse of the two youngsters, eight and nine in Hampstead, and uh, after a series of secret family court cases, uh, which I, I will 
just comment on separately. Uh, all of a sudden, um, we've had a judgment by Mrs. Justice Palfrey, and um, the papers are now screaming. Look at the headline here, pictured the mother who tortured her two children to lie about a satanic child sex cult based at a primary school to get back at her ex in custody dispute. The mother forced the children to lie. Uh, They named the children. She said the couple may have, notice the language, may have fed the children cannabis soup to gain compliance. And more than four million people have viewed the fantasy material online. Now, what is um, interesting about this uh, case is... is, uh, well, I'll, st- I'll start off by stating that I have personally met the mother and the partner. I do not have any doubts at all about what uh, the mother and her partner have said about the abuse of those two children. I'm very happy to make that statement. Um, we have then seen the children within 24 hours taken away from the mother into the custody of local social services, Barnet. Uh, We have seen police officers threatened by other metropolitan police officers to get them away from the case. And then we have seen uh, a series of court cases secret under the uh, family court rules. Uh, So the only people inside those uh, those court proceedings were the legal teams for local authorities, social services, uh, the police, of course, the mother and a partner having to defend themselves. They did have some legal representation. But following a series of secret court cases, we then have a public statement by the judge, Mrs. Uh, Justice Palfrey, and she says, well, general public in Britain, whole thing, complete and utter pack of lies, uh, which many people have said, well, this is very interesting, Ms. Palfrey, because... Uh, Online was published the medical report in which a very experienced uh, doctor examined both the children and stated categorically that both these children had been seriously sexually abused. Now, in her statement, the judge simply doesn't deal with this matter. But what we now know from people who were present in court is, is that there was an attack on the medical doctors to say, well, actually, your report wasn't really correct, was it? So we are now in Britain, 2015, where there is a serious sexual attack on children. The whole proceedings held behind closed doors. And then one single judge releases a statement to the press and suddenly her version, which I'm going to say is an outrageous uh, version of the truth, is then released, and we should all believe it. And what is worse, this judge has said to, to the general public, if you're somebody who viewed the uh, children giving uh, uh, on-camera uh, evidence as to what has happened to them, if you're somebody in the public who's viewed it, you're actually pretty close to being a paedophile yourself, and certainly you're evil. So we have got secret courts now uh, where people are talking about serious sexual abort, and we've got a statement by one judge, we should believe her. What's your take on it, David? It, it really is an incredible situation. Um, on, on one level, in Scotland, it... it, it keeps throwing up parallels to the Holly Gregg case because we have um, a single judge making a decision. We have the official line being there's nothing to see here. There's nothing to see here. Um, or it must be the mother who, who, who put her slash them up to it. Oh, she's just trying to get back at her ex-husband. All of this is straight out the Holly Gregg playbook. Um, and we've then got, well, what about all the medical evidence? Well, let's not talk about the medical evidence. Uh, it's it's ridiculous. Um, this uh, single judge, uh, we uh, had a wee look, a colleague of mine had a look for some information and came across a, a blog written by someone who is very uh, key in the Fathers for Justice movement um, who had the pleasure of being um, under the tender mercies of this judge and who wrote a very um, heartfelt defence of his position of liberty 
and and basically said that there's one child abuse scandal in this country bigger than institutional paedophile abuse, and that is the family courts, the secret family courts in England, who have been harming and abusing in their own tender ways tens of thousands of children now in in all across the country. And it's it's a, it's a situation that will eventually uh, be revealed. And when it is, um, the the judges responsible um, are going to be in serious trouble because the whole thing is just uh, is just a catalogue of, of of official abuse of of the individual. Um, as far as the children is con- are concerned, the the medical evidence was extremely compelling, and the um, fact that. Police officers are being threatened not to investigate this. Um, we, we've just been through a year of revelations about how this happened. Oh, but it's all in the past. In the 70s, yes, but it's in the past. In the 80s, yes, but we're not doing that anymore. In the 90s, yes, but it's in the past. And and here it's now happening live. And nobody notices, it would appear, in the mainstream media or in officialdom, that we're running the same scenario one more time. Yeah, that, this, this is a, a very key point that you've raised, that uh, if you look at the spin in the, uh, the media, the press, it's always this is something that took place in the past. And indeed, I spoke on the telephone this morning with Oxfordshire Child Safeguarding Board uh, because they're boasting on their website they've got a special pledge, a promise, that if um, anyone contacts them with knowledge about child abuse, uh, they will get on to the case, they will look into it. So I called them and I said, um, uh, of course, they had never properly investigated the abuse that took part uh, took place at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College. Indeed, there's a provable cover-up. There was collaboration in that cover-up between uh, Oxfordshire City County Council, the college and Thames Valley Police. And I said, so does your pledge extend to Oxford and Cherwell Valley College victims? And I have to say, a very nice lady said that she would go away and talk to one of the senior managers who would call me back. But I'm afraid to say I don't think there was a call back. I may have missed it. I will certainly be checking up. Uh, But I think this is just a scam that's being put across. It's all in the past. And we are making procedural changes. We're not going to bring people into court uh, to bring the full force of the law to bear on abusers. We're just going to make procedural changes. Now, in this particular case, the Hampstead uh, case, it's very interesting that the judge is actually uh, the same lady judge who very early on dealt with um, Anne and Holly Gregg. And I have to say, I have to say um, that uh, this was the lady at one stage that tried to get Anne uh, Gregg, the mother, and Robert Green into the court with no representation to protect them. And she was very insistent on this until uh, Robert uh, uh, very bravely said, well, under the um, uh, e- uh, equity at law, uh, we both can have um, uh, the same same defence uh, present, representation present. What you're doing is not right. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Anne and Robert stuck to their guns and eventually this judge backed down and their legal advisers were allowed into the hearing Um, and I can speak with authority on this because I was one of those people. Um, Now there was a complaint made as a result of her action that either she didn't know the law or she was attempting to pervert the course of law by bringing these two very vulnerable people into a closed court. Um, So early on fascinating to see what took place around uh, Anne and Holly Gregg and of course Robert receives a gagging order for a year and here we have this couple who I say I met, I sat down and talked to for several hours and uh, I warned them of what would take place and that would be there would be an inversion of the case and they would become the targeted individuals while the state closed down. I'll just end by saying that um, a person who was present in this latest hearing uh, that resulted in uh, uh, Mrs Justice Palfrey's judgment said it was an extraordinary scene inside the court because there were 
There was a vast number of people representing the local authorities of, say, CAFCAS and social services and the police. The court was full of people representing the state uh, to the extent the atmosphere was, was extremely heavy and unpleasant. And the person said, I thought I was amongst the witch's coven in that court. So just... It's outrageous what's been printed. The UK column is going to stay on the course on the case. We think public attention should be focused on this particular judge and the outrage which is Britain's secret courts in 2015. I'm always amazed at how understated it always comes out when the British are talking about something. This is the most outrageous thing I've ever heard of. Um, the judge presents it as the mother trying to get back at the father. Now, the father had been guilty of violence in that relationship so often that his visitations of the children was only once every two weeks. I mean, what, what would Ella been, be trying to gain by this? She would have to, in order to set this thing up, she'd have to have her children sodomized such that it would damage their rectums so that it, you know, it was repeated abuse over a period of time. That's what the medical examiner said. And also concoct this story. And I don't know whether you've seen the testimony of the children. You can see it on on our podcast, number 133, World Beyond Belief. Uh, you can see all the tapes of the of the kids' testimonies and judge for yourself. Imagine her trying to, first of all, concoct that much information and then feed it to the children. Now, the children are very bright, so they could, they could learn a lot. But I think the consistency of their tales and the, and the actual details that they come up with, um, if Ella Draper could do this, I think that she's gone way beyond human capabilities. So... The judge's, you know, proposal of how this thing came about is absolutely, totally ludicrous, if you think about it at all. Also, Ella Draper wasn't in the court when this thing transpired, quite frankly, because she was driven out of the country. A SWAT team came to her door, and just luckily she had, I believe, a barrister there who was able to, knowing his rights, keep them outside while Ella escaped out the back. Uh, she would have been arrested and held, and now she's being accused of child molestation of her own children. Um, so that's why she wasn't there. You know, they say that when a soldier gives his life for his country, that's the ultimate sacrifice. I'm not sure that is, because I think this woman, Ella Draper, has given her children and up to this this ludicrous court system, justice system, criminal justice system, system in England. And now she's without her children. She's in Russia now with her partner. Uh, they have to be they have to be hiding out because there's arrest warrants for them under this ludicrous ac accusation. I think she's got a lot of credibility. I thought the kids had a lot of credibility, and I used some of my background in neurolinguistic program to try to analyze whether these children were telling the truth. And they seem to, to me, you know, I'm not an expert, but I do know some things. Let's move on and hear, hear from the mother. Now, this is the person who supposedly did all this. This is the person who's lost her children. Let's hear from Ella Draper herself. I believe the children, when they describe how infants are frequently delivered to school, they are raped, tortured, injected in the neck, and their necks are cut with a sharp knife held by them, with their dead hands over the top. I believe my children, when they say that the infant's neck is cut and the infant body uh, is turned upside down to collect the blood into a bowel, into, into a bowl. 
The blood is poured into a, sibli- into a silver uh, goblet and drunk by their dead, then passed to them, their vegans, by the way, and then passed to the rest of the children and staff. The infants are been disemboweled. The infant's body is then cooked in the cooker and eaten by the children of 20 special families, Mr. Damon, teachers, parents, for lunch. The children describe how their dad sometimes eats infants twice a day. From the names and details provided, I have no doubts that both my children are telling the truth about the rapes, sodomy, murders and cannibalism at the Christ Church in Hampstead Square, London, NW3, 1AB, at Christ Church Primary School and at least seven other primary schools nearby. I also believe that my children have suffered nightmares, physical, psychological and mental torture by many public servants involved in the trafficking of infants into the UK for human sacrifice and organ harvesting. I believe my children are telling the truth when they describe that their father is the leader of a satanic cult which which traffics infants from all over the world. I also believe that many parents have foster children and abuse the children at the school as part of a satanic cult. I believe this cult has been going on for many decades. I also believe that public servants are doing their utmost to conceal the crimes for fear of losing jobs and lucrative incomes. I am very disappointed that the police have failed to do any investigation into the rapes and sodomy by their dad, teachers and head teachers, and other public servants, as well as private individuals despite forensic medical evidence that their allegations are true. I believe that Abraham had conducted excellent interviews with the children to encourage them to talk about their painful about their painful experiences so as to put a stop to these crimes against infants and children by public officials and under other individuals when compared to the police interviews. I believe that the police were involved in a cover up The police interviewed the children without my presence, refusing me the opportunity to be be there while the police kept them up quite late and did not allow the children to give names of the parents and teachers raping the children or the names of the children who were raped. I wish to rely on the video interviews of the children by Abraham, which were confirmed in the police interviews on 5th and 11th of September 2014. The police interview, dated 17 of September 2014, is not reliable because it took place after the children were taken to the care, unaccompanied, unaccompanied by me, in secret, after the incriminating evidence of the plastic willies, the skulls and other evidence, evidences were destroyed. In February 2015, there was, a, uh, there was a skip outside the church with a renovation to temper with the incriminating evidence of the rapes and murders and satanic rituals. I do not agree, I do not agree with the medical report that Abraham caused Gabriel ear to bleed after hitting him. It was in fact his dad, Mr. Damon, who did it, who did that. Children admitted, um, uh, confirmed this fact. I believe the nine police officers who came to my home on 10th February 2015 were from the same satanic cult of which Mr. Damon is the cult leader, so as to kidnap me to silence me. I give this witness statement on video and on paper because I was driven out of the UK under threat of kidnap or worse. I seek the urgent return of my children to my care for which I have a care order in my favour. I seek assistance of the various British and Russian authorities and embassies in the repatriation of my children to Russia to live with me and my parents. I seek court or protection for the witnesses from kidnapping, 
by Mr. Diamond's cult members and his agents. I seek the arrest and prosecution of all who perverted the course of justice, including Judge Powerfully for treason. I seek the shutting down of both Barnett and Camden councils for the active participation and cover-up of satanic rituals in their schools, nurseries, churches, leisure centers, office buildings, involving, involving hundreds of their staff and agents, including police. That's about the most courageous thing I've ever heard. That tape is also on YouTube, and you can, you can search it out and find it. I think she's a very courageous woman. Uh, she's had to flee to Russia to avoid either the cult or, I was under the impression it was a SWAT team came to her house. It sounded like a SWAT team. That tape's available on YouTube, too. You know, that's a wonderful thing that's happening with this particular case. People are finding things out and putting them on online so we can all find out about it. There are also a group of researchers, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, that are digging in. They're doing what the police should have done in terms of looking on Facebook, finding out who's connected with who, trying to trace back where these babies came from, and they're finding out, and it's online. So that's a wonderful thing that's happening. But anyway, that was Ella's statement. Now, I believe Ella because I, I watched her children, and I believe every word they said. And I was wondering how credible Ella seemed. And then I accidentally came across uh, a strange interview on YouTube. It was a person who was doing general crowd interview about, I think it was a reaction to this particular case. And out of the audience steps forward this detective, detective sergeant, and he speaks out and he tells what he thinks, having interviewed Ella. Let's hear from that detective. Can I add a piece to that? As a yeah. former police officer of 20 years, I had the opportunity of actually sitting with a mother in this case for three hours. I can absolutely tell you with my experience of interrogation over a 20-year period, as a former detective sergeant, she was speaking 110% truth. I know there's been no investigation, there's no, been no proper police statement taken from this woman because of the way she's been harassed. I also know that we have child abuse in this country to epidemic levels. I was on Saturday sitting with a former MP from the Home Office who categorically stated to me that we've got now about one in ten children being abused. And we have a police force that's in denial, and it's not you, I know that. It comes from senior levels. We now need to recognise this and start acting on it to change the ethos of what is wrecking so many children's lives and costing so much deprivation and degradation to the way we live on this planet. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really putting that out there clearly. Everybody knows it. We've got to start acting on it. And a great time to do that is at this election. Yeah. We've got an election coming up and we need on the hustings to ask what our MPs are doing about this. A lot of it is un underpinned by the ridiculous situation that we've got with debt and the way our financial system actually constrains people from, from talking. Well, that certainly needs looking at. But just think, we have a former Home Office Minister who has said that we've got one in ten children being abused. And it's going on now. It's not historic. It was historic, but it's happening now. And Ella and those two children's case is not unique. I sat with her for three hours and she, what she shared was 100% truth. And I know no police officers have properly investigated this. It's incumbent upon you, Sergeant, to make sure that that investigation starts fully and fairly. And I'm not looking to blame. But what I'm looking for is a time when we can turn our backs on this sort of happening, that we can keep our children safe, and we can live a life where they can flourish and not be suppressed. I was with someone who was abused by a Catholic priest. It massively, massively changes people's lives. And there are people around me here who have been abused. 
it hugely changes lives. So if we can't look after our children in this society, mm -hmm. we're doing a pretty, pretty poor job. So let's change it. You know, I know you're a good man, and there's good men around here and good women around here who want to see that happen. So let's make it happen. Tell us again your uh, former title. I was a detective sergeant in Sussex Police. Your name? Okay. Ray Savvy. What that makes what makes that totally amazing is that man was standing in the crowd and was so compelled to come forward to risk himself and notice he there was a there was a policeman standing right next to them you know in the crowd and he was careful to make sure that that policeman knew that he wasn't accusing him but he realized it was from higher ups this goes all the way up all of these things implicate even on the highest level in all the governments. The people that run this planet are pedophile Satanists. Let's just face it. And the sooner we can expose it, then the rest of us, the, mil the billions of the rest of us, can react to it, the better off we're going to be. <clears throat> now I'm going to take us back to the UK column. And what they're going to do is talk to, is, is give you an article, present to you an article of how the mainstream media over there is characterizing Ella Draper in this case. Let's go to UK column again. Well, can we rely on our press to report the truth? Uh, we've occasionally stuck up for Britain's uh, journalists saying they're beginning to wake up, but it's a very mixed picture. And we thought today for crass reporting we'd focus on the daily mail and here is their unbelievable article the yummy mummy a satanic sex cult and the smears that terrorized a very swish london suburb yoga teacher forced her children to make false abuse allegations against teachers priests and their own father it's quite a headline so we decided that we would actually phone the, journal, the Daily Mail to see whether we could speak to the journalists uh, concerned. And the journalists are Paul Bracci, Tim Stewart and Stephanie uh, Condron. Well, we managed two out of the three. Let's have a look at some of the information we were given. Uh, we were told very clearly that Paul Bracci is the lead for the story. He was assisted by a so-called researcher, Tim Stewart, and uh, Stephanie Condron was merely a contributor to the article. Uh, she got a little bit squeamish when I asked her some basic questions and uh, she was very quick to distance herself from the story. An outrageous story which simply smears and undermines the mother and uh, prints pictures of her in her bikini um, as part of that smear process. Well, the Daily Mail uh, team had not met either the mother or her partner um, quite extraordinary stuff. They said very clearly that, um, well, it's easy to run a story on a court judgment because then we don't have to worry about our own legal team. Uh, they told me that uh, the Daily Mail team were happy with Judge Palfrey's attack on the, um, uh, the medical evidence of abuse. They didn't have a problem with that at all. And uh, basically... In the limited discussion before they got quite hostile, um, they revealed a pathetic knowledge, really, about what child abuse is about, the scale of it, and the sheer cover-up, perjury, lies, falsification of reports that goes on inside uh, family court hearings. So these so-called mainstream uh, journalists we can reveal simply wrote a story based on what the judge said from this terrible case and what they had picked up online. Uh, they had apparently spoken to some of the parents at the school and, of course, the parents had said, well, we haven't done anything. So the Daily Mail said, well, that's OK then. A bit like Oxford and Sherwell Valley College. Very similar to Oxford and Sherwell Valley College. Now, we have said we're going to continue to report on this case. Uh, we covered a little bit in the news last week. This was sent through to me shortly before we started the news today, just to say that that snippet um, had um, one source alone already got nearly 3,000 views. Um, we're going to continue to 
uh, fight for the truth about child abuse in Hampstead. And we think that it can best be done using really this as an example. What sort of thing do we need to look at? Well, we think we need to know exactly what did take place in what were secret court hearings. Uh, we want to know why the police, the police coached the children. It's very clear from the videos of the police in action that the children were coached to retract their statements. We want to know what actual investigations the Met Police carried out into the abusers of the children on the basis the medical report showed very clearly the children had suffered sexual abuse. We would like to know why the judge attacked the medical report and indeed the doctor producing it, even uh, particularly as it demonstrated the children had been abused. Uh, we want to know why there has been no criminal court case, why this has been held in a very secretive uh, family court with uh, just one judge. And uh, we'd like to know why the Daily Mail and others have pr printed sensationalist smear stories. And also we would like to know why Metropolitan Police officers were threatened to back away from this case. So when we have a look at the uh, facts around the Hampstead abuse case, uh, isn't it amazing we can see the threats, the intimidation, the lies, the false reports, the secret courts. It's it's like Holly Gregg south of the border, Mike. It, it did stagger me, uh, some of the responses from the journalists. And, and you've got to ask, um, what goes through somebody's mind as a journalist when they're looking at a story like this um, and they don't actually do the work to find out, you know, objectively what, what the story is about before they print something like that? Well, it's, it's sloppy journalism. Of course, they're all being paid to do a proper job. And actually, what, what I've learned from talking to the Daily Mail reporters this morning is, is they're simply going on the internet and trying to cruise off the back of all of the work that, that some very good people have done to post up factual information about what happened around Hampstead. So I'm going to say that I was absolutely appalled at the uh, gross lack of knowledge by those Daily Mail journalists and for them to simply be almost laughing that, well, of course, the moment the judge made, made a judgment, that meant we didn't really have to pay attention to what we printed. So we printed a, uh, effectively nearly a full page smear article on the mother and her partner. When I attempted to uh, discuss wider aspects of child abuse, how many children were abused in Britain, uh, why there was no central database of statistics of children abused in care. Um, the journalists simply didn't want to know. In fact, they couldn't get off the phone fast enough. So, I mean, it makes cover-up so much easier if, if, if journalists aren't doing their jobs. Well, I think as we're going to show a little bit later in the news, Mike, if journalists don't get off their um, armchairs or get out of their armchairs and start to do some serious reporting, I think they're in for a big shock. I think a lot of our, our mainstream journalists at the moment have just got used to living in a cosy country where there's something very nasty brewing. And as I've said to many mainstream journalists, the first, some of the first people to die in dictatorships are actually investigative journalists. So we'll wait and see. Now, I'm pretty familiar with the Daily Mail as a journalistic source, and it is pretty much mainstream over there, and it is pretty much... Not a good place to rely to get your information, as you noticed from this thing. Yummy mummy? I mean, how is that How is that possible? It's a smear campaign. You can tell that the mainstream media all over the world, not just in England, is run by the powers that be, and the powers that be are connected with these satanic cults. So, that, so now, Ella Draper and... Abraham Christie are fair game for anything the mainstream media wants to do to lambast them and, and disrupt their reputation. And when the mainstream media does that, it really leads to big trouble, but it leads to big trouble mainly for us, the little guys. Remember when they did Saddam Hussein? He was our ally until the, the media decided that he was a, a monster and a villain. We were the ones that gave him his um, weapons of mass destruction, if he had any. They did the same thing to, to Gaddafi in Libya. 
all of a sudden he's a horrible, bad person, and now we can do, do horrible things to him. So it's like they take the gloves off. Okay, media, sick them. Now, this is great that this is happening because this is showing us exactly what's going on and exactly their next tactic. This is what they have to do. It's a smear campaign. It's, it's a bad judgment. We're, we're protecting the Satanists and we're smearing the people who want to bring them to justice. That's the strategy right now. Now, the UK column is pursuing this and I'm really pleased. I'm going to play a, yet another clip from the UK column to see how resolute they are at getting to the bottom of this and blowing this thing wide open. Here's the UK column a little bit later report on the Hampstead uh, child abuse case. Uh, we're watching this with great interest because, of course, the UK column had the opportunity of speaking directly with the mother and her partner right at the beginning of the case. And so uh, uh, our foundation is a very good one, a factual meeting with the parents. Uh, many others at the moment are talking about simply what they've seen and heard on the internet. But let's just remind uh, our viewers that when UK Column on the 20th of March started to ask some basic questions about what was going on, and we had a video, uh, the sort of things we were asking um, were, what can we do to fight for this case? And we think a lot of this is to ask the right questions. We want to know what took place in what were a secret court. Uh, we want to know why the police coached the children when the police interviewed them. Uh, we want to know exactly what investigations the Met Police have carried out. We want to know why the judge attacked the medical report which demonstrated serious sexual abuse. Uh, we want to know why there's been no criminal court case. And we want to know why the Daily Mail and others such as the Telegraph have printed very damaging sensationalist smear stories. And uh, finally, uh, because we... Uh, were present with uh, police officers at the time. We want to know why Met Police, who uh, were trying to help with this case, were threatened. Now, one of the things that would sort out the uh, fact from fiction in the Hampstead case very quickly is if the police, of course, simply uh, brought in uh, a number of people for questioning and those people were physically examined for the marks and tattoos and other intimate bodily features which the children so clearly identified in their video. Uh, we have received a certain amount of, of abuse for saying this. However, what we were suggesting falls within the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. So let's have a look at that on screen. And here we are. Uh, basically, um, if an officer of at least the rank of inspector authorises it, a person who is detained in a police station may be searched or examined or both, for the purpose of ascertaining whether he has any mark that would tend to identify him as a person involved in the commission of an offence. Um, so there we are. There are very clear rules about this, and of course the children in their video interview uh, identified a number of very detailed um, physical marks amongst their abusers, including tattoos, uh, warts and piercings. Uh, and piercings and therefore it is very very easy for the Metropolitan Police to establish whether the children's accusations are correct. Uh, to our knowledge the Metropolitan Police have absolutely failed to carry out this basic investigation in the, in the meantime we've seen a massive smear campaign by British press. So let's remember um, the lives of these two young children at stake uh, the UK column has not named or identified these children. We'll continue to run with that policy. Uh, but what they were talking about was a particularly vile and systematic uh, sexual and satanic ritual abuse by a number of individuals across the whole spectrum of the local society, including social services people, school teachers and others. Now, to join this in with uh, Guy, Ta uh, Guy Taylor's um, comments to us that he's just made, um, let's have a look at uh, the Telegraph here. This was the Telegraph smear campaign. Uh, look at the headline, Satanic Cult Claims Dismissed by High Court Judge. Miss, uh, Mrs Justice Paul Flea says the claims circulating on the internet are baseless, as she describes people who seek to perpetuate them as evil or foolish. 
after fact-finding exercise. So we're being told here that she has conducted a fact-finding exercise in her secret court. We're not dealing with the results of a full police investigation uh, properly made uh, known to the public. And where has the uh, Telegraph got the story from? Well, in the bottom right-hand corner, it simply says it's an agency report. So here is one of Britain's um, most prestigious newspapers simply relying on internet press reports uh, to decide what the truth is around the vicious abuse of these two young children. Well, it gets worse because we can announce today that according to the Ham and High newspaper, the local Hampstead newspaper, um, police investigations have now been launched into what is now being described as a fantasy. Uh, what is this based on? Uh, simply based on what one high court judge has said in a closed courtroom. And where is this leading? Uh, well, of course, we have inversion of the law that the people who've tried to expose and help the children are now being hunted by the police. And we understand that one of the lead ladies uh, wanted by the police, uh, well, of course, the mother is the <coughs> foremost one, uh, but Sabine McNeil, who has um, reported uh, uh, most, um, uh, has done most of the reporting over the internet, uh, according to this article, is now wanted by the police. Uh, this is what Tam and High says. As a result of the judge's findings and the material published online, police have launched two investigations related uh, to the case, one into allegations of harassment and another into the findings that the children had been tortured. The Ham and High has learnt that Mrs Draper and uh, Ms Sabine McNeil, her legal supporter, are included on the wanted list. Uh, to which we say to our audience, it is remarkable uh, that uh, the mother and her partner, of course, did all of the right things in the beginning. Uh, they listened to what uh, the children said, and then horrified by what the children said, the mother and her partner approached both the police and social services for help. And here we are, weeks later, where the whole case has been inverted so that the mother and partner are the people at fault. Meanwhile, the Met Police has simply failed to conduct any proper investigations. And uh, if I can just bring that slide up uh, again, I've just underlined the judge's findings, uh, because, of course, um, the judge has simply carried out a probe, I think is the interim in a secret court. And we're going to say again, if the case is false, why were Metropolitan Police officers threatened when they tried to assist in the case? And also, why are they denying the fact that there is a satanic abuse department with inside the Met as well? That is now being said that there isn't one bone. Well, that's, we a, that's a key point, yeah. Louise. Uh, it was Metropolitan Police officers who first informed the UK column of the existence of a satanic abuse unit within the Met Police and indeed, uh, Met Police were the people releasing that information, and now suddenly is there, no such there is no such unit. Yes, I'll just say that um, there was some interesting information pass, passed to me yesterday, which is effectively um, a networking system, which is I think is called the brain, and this is being circulated by email. Um, so it's, it's a computer program which enables you to plot data, link people, places... Uh, things and information together. And what appears to be happening is that uh, just a loose group of people across the internet are now starting to work together, digging, researching about this child abuse. And this is, I find this very interesting and I find it exciting because, of course, if we end up with 10,000, 100,000 people all digging for information, witness statements, and indeed to meet victims of abuse. That is a very powerful search engine, and I think that that is going to turn up the type of evidence we need Definitely. to bring the people you'd like to bring to book mm. uh, to get them into court. So uh, we'll follow that through and report on it. But I also know that Anonymous has been doing some very um, good research around the Hampstead case um, without getting into a witch hunt, because I think that's wrong. But there's some very uh, clever film clips that have now gone up 
uh, where people are being linked um, with others and what that does is raises questions you know if I just give an, uh, uh, an example off the top of my head if you have one person uh, who is claiming that they're clean but they're in a business relationship with another person who was convicted of child abuse you have to start asking some questions and we're seeing more and more of this yeah, I've noticed that online there are a bunch of people that are researching and putting things together. They're doing things like linking people up through their Facebook friends. There's one person I saw most recently that was trying to find the trail of the babies that they sacrificed coming in. And they found the people who most likely were involved. Uh, they're linking up their financial backers, and they're linking up exactly how they get them into uh, the UK from places uh, as far away as San Francisco, Portugal, and, and whatever. It's really inspiring. You know, a couple of weeks ago I was talking about when, when did the mobs stop? When, and I was thinking of Frankenstein mob. When did that, when did, when did people stop doing that kind of thing? And when did we turn it all over to the government? Uh, the police and child protective services. Why? When did we stop taking responsibility? And here, now, since this outrageous decision made by Judge Palfrey was made, now we know. Now we know it's like it's like on. I'm going to keep to, I'm going to keep up to date on this case, and I, I encourage you to too. A couple places I've been going on a daily basis to look on this case is a blog spot called Anger Fan. Let me spell it for you. And I'll have it linked up at the bottom of the, uh, of the description if you're on YouTube. It's spelled A-A-N-G-I-R-F-A-N dot blogspot dot C-O dot U-K. This is a blog spot I ran into, a, oh, I don't know how long ago. It was, it's been a few months. And uh, this person goes in. He does quick analysis on a lot of subjects. And then he'll post kind of the stream that he finds. But he always, or she, always gives the disclaimer that, you know, this is, I'm just reporting what I'm finding. But it's a good it's been keeping up to date on the Hempstead case, and I suggest you put this on one of your favorite websites so you can check it often. Also, I've been, I learned that uh, there's a YouTube channel called Code 2222, and the way that's put out is code is capitalized, C-O-D-E, and then there's a space. And then there's two written T-W-O four times. So it's capital C-O-D-E space T-W-O, 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 T-W-O. And they're posting everything uh, having to do with this case. So you can really keep up. And you can find out. And actually, this is where I ran into these, these individual people that are investigating and linking things up. And I guess now they're using a computer program called the brain to find all these things. This is, this is the most amazing thing because it really shows that we're capable of taking care of ourselves. We're capable of, of standing up to this, to this horrible threat. I also think that there's another positive angle to this case. It's out there. I mean, unless you're a TV watcher or just addicted to the mainstream news or live in a mayonnaise jar or in a cave in, in the outback of Afghanistan somewhere, you've got to be aware of what's going on. You've got to see this case for what it is. You've got to look into these children's testimony. You've got to follow it. And I think I've linked up today, we've linked up pretty good trail for you to see, well, particularly Ella Draper's, side of this case, which I think is the truthful side after working with this thing for uh, about six weeks now. 
I think the sides are being drawn. You know, I think battle lines are being drawn. We know who they are, and we know who the enemy is. They are Satanists. I know this is outrageous and incredibly hard to believe, but there are Satanists that run the power on this planet. And there's a, there's a bunch of evidence. This is a piece of evidence. How could you cover up something like this unless you had people in extremely high places? And you know the, the accusations against Cyril Smith and Leon Britton and Jimmy Savile have lead right up to the royal family. And the royal family, the royals, are just like the American royals you know, the Bushes and the, the Rockefellers. They, they run the country. They, that's, that, they control the country. Um, in the middle of reading a book, actually, I'm almost finished, by Dr. John Coleman on the Committee of 300. And he is a, uh, an insider and investigator who has put together the links between this Committee of 300, which is 300 people, from the bloodline families that seem to direct and, what can I say, orchestrate the actions of all the governments. Uh, he's also written a book on Tavistock, which I haven't gotten to yet, but the Committee of 300 runs Tavistock. And Tavistock has brought us oh, spectacular events like World War I, World War II, Pearl Harbor, and a lot of things, the Beatles, rock and roll music, the hippie movement, these are all Tavis Esalen Institute, and all that, that surrounds the Esalen Institute, LSD, I mean, it's all orchestrated by the Committee of 300, and I would say, knowing what I know about the ones that have been, that have been named, he's got in this book a list of the people, past and present, who have been there. I can link them up to Satanism, exactly right away. Also, there's another book that's coming out, that has come out. I haven't gotten to read it yet. It's called The Franklin Cover Cover-Up, and it's an expose on what happens on Mohemian Grove. Now, if you listen to my show very often, you'll know that I often refer back to the satanic ritual that's done every year in Bohemian Grove, California, and it's attended by the rich and powerful. I mean, all the past presidents. I'm not, I'm not going to say that. I know that uh, I've seen pictures of Reagan and pictures of Nixon there. Oh, Eisenhower I've seen there. I don't know about Kennedy. And you can bet your boots that the Bushes and the Clinton and probably Obama, although I don't know. I've never seen a picture of him there. But it, what it is, it's, they enact... The cremation of care ceremony, which is a satanic, it's a Canaanite pre-Babylonian ritual sacrifice of children to ensure continued financial success. That's what it is. I mean, you can research it. They admit that they do that. Now, they say that they use plastic babies, but I'm betting, I'm betting especially now that we're finding out what's happening in Hempstead, I don't think plastic babies would appease Satan if there is such a such an individual. But anyway, so the battle lines are drawn. We know who the enemy is. It's not the Muslims anymore. It's not the the Jews. It's not the it's the Satanists and their and the bloodline families that are running this. Of course they run the Jesuits. Of course they run the Zionists. Of course they run the upper escalons of the free basins. But we know who they are. Now we know, we know that they need to do these ritual sacrifices to appease whatever entity they, ha they, they know or they think is, is running things, is giving them their power. It doesn't matter whether we believe it or not. It's the fact that they believe it and they're doing these horrible things in the name of this evil entity. And when you look at it, and, all, and you go back and you, you read these things by John Coleman, and you realize how much 
of your individual life that you've just finished, li that you're living, has been orchestrated by Tavistock, has been created by the Committee of 300, and just giving, given kind of to you as an experience so they can do their thing. It makes you really realize how big and how powerful they are. They control I, most of the world's riches and wealth. They control, uh, well, let's go back and talk about how many of these Satanists there might be. I heard an interview the other day by Jay Parker. Now, Jay Parker is someone who's, who's on the Internet. You can find him on the YouTube giving uh, lectures. He's a, he's a Satanist. He was born into a Satanist family, like, like um, Elisa and Gabriel were. He was born into this. He had no choice. And he grew up finally, for some way, some, some kind of way, he got out of it. And he reflects that he thinks there are about 34 million Satanists throughout the world. And they're orchestrating all this mayhem and madness and evil that's going on the wars and the, the false flags and the, the blaming and the disruption of governments and the forced vaccinations and the police state. They're behind all that. Now, also, I'm not sure whether they're all, they would all be Satanists that would take place in these rituals. I don't think all Satanists do that. Well, I, you know, we Americans hate, or Americans English-speaking people hate generalizations that say all. So I'm going to say, let's say half. Let's say half of the Satanists, that's half of 34 million, do these rituals, and they do it with children. <laughs> that's an awful lot of children. That's an awful lot of sacrifices. And those people control, now what can I call? I can call them parapsychopaths that are below them that will do anything for money, or they can be blackmailed into doing anything. And I would, I would point to the parliament in England, uh, the Congress in the United States, probably the parliament in Australia, as being people that are parapsychopaths, probably controlled by the Satanist elite. Uh, you know, they could be partially Satanist elite themselves but they control a lot of power and they control a lot of money. But here's the deal. They're doing bad things. They're definitely embodying evil. They're definitely the inversion. They're definitely the, the warp in the matrix. They're definitely the disease in the machine. They're not natural. They're not, they're not obeying universal natural law. And so, when we act against them, and we're working within natural law, like something to do in natural law would be to protect the children. When we're working in accordance to natural law, things go, it's like the universe is on our side. Things work out for us. Even though they control, even though the Satanists control all this power, all this money and can do all this stuff, they're still outside of the natural order of law. Like, you know, natural law is like gravity. They can't disobey gravity without consequences. I mean, you get really hurt if you try to disobey gravity. The same as these natural laws. To give you a little background in natural law, because what I think we should do is we should position ourselves coming from natural law, coming from the moral high ground, and then think about things that we can do to get them to stop this satanic ritual abuse of children. Let's learn about natural law from somebody who has seen both sides of this picture. I'm going to play a clip from Mark Passio. Now, Mark Passio knows moral law because he is an ex-Satanist, and he saw it from outside the moral law. He taught us at one time, and I've done this over and over again on our broadcast, he taught us the four tenets of Satanism. The first one being the worship of ego, worship of one's own ego. And I'm sure that they get strength through ritual at some, at some hierarchy on the, the, the Satanist ladder. The second tenant is moral 
relativity. That means everything is all right. Remember Alistair, Alistair Crowley, the famous, the old famous Satanist? The, he called himself the Beast. Takes credit for killing 181 or 180 boys. He's a horrible person. Uh, definitely instrumental in setting up the CIA. But definitely a horrible person anyway. But anyway, his uh, logo is do what you will. You know, do anything you want. That You can do that when you have moral relativity. But natural law contains morality. There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. It's wrong to kill a baby. I don't care what your rationalization is, that you need it because... Um, you're doing a ritual to, to gain money for your ego. It's not right. There are moral rights and wrongs. And because the Satanists teach that there are none, uh, you can fall into that trap of rationalizing anything you want to do. Also, the third tenet of Satanism is social Darwinism. You know, the, mo the most ruthless survive, and the one that has contacts maybe survives. And then it leads to eugenics. And everybody that listens to the world beyond belief knows that there's a major eugenics program underway to cut down the population. But let's hear this ex-Satanist, uh, Mark Passio, explain moral law. I think actually another reason I want to play this is because I think it's really motivational. When I listen to him talk about natural law as opposed to this superimposed artificial legal system that's all about justice, which is just us, you know, the ruling elite. I really get inspired. Uh, so I hope that the same thing happens to you. Here's Mark Passio. Natural law versus man's law or government. Here's the differences. Natural law is based upon the principles. It's based upon principles and truth. Meaning, things that are inherent to creation are not made by humankind. Natural law can only either be harmonized with due to knowledge and understanding or rejected due to ignorance. So it's not, it's not something that is based on compliance because of we fear the punishment that would result of not understanding it. Okay? If you don't understand it and live according to it, the result is inescapable. Because men and women are not actually creating the result, okay? The universe is bringing that result to us, intelligently and dynamically, all right? In other words, once again, this is about consequences. You behave a certain way, there's certain consequences. You change the behavior, you'll change the consequential results. Natural law is universal, which means that it exists and applies anywhere in the universe regardless of physical location. There is no place you can go in the physical universe to escape natural law. Let me know if you find a way out of this universe and into another where natural law no longer applies, and uh, you know we'll take a look at it together. But until you figure out the way out of this universe and into a place that's not governed by law, you're bound by natural law. Okay? Natural law is eternal. It, it will exist for as long as the universe exists, and it is immutable exists and applies for as long as the universe exists and cannot be changed by anything humanity is capable of doing or any other species in the universe is capable of doing for that matter. Man's law, on the other hand, let's look at how this contrasts with natural law. It's not based on principles and truth. It's based on dogmatic beliefs that are programs that are running in the human mind. These are constructs of the mind that operate like programs. Nat uh, man's law is complied with due to the fear of the punishment that will be conducted upon people who attempt to not comply with it. It's most of the only reason people ever comply with the law of man. And that's a very low state of consciousness, fear. That really is only going to get you all the negative things that we say we don't want if we're in that vibration. Man's law differs with location based upon the whim of legislators, like prohibition. Well, I'm allowed to smoke marijuana in one state, and then I could be jailed for it in another. My freedom can be taken if I cross this imaginary line. Hey, I'm, I'm a gun owner, okay? If I, take one, if I take certain weapons that I own, 
across an imaginary line, I could be jailed for years. But over this side of the imaginary line, it's okay. And you're just exercising a right. Hey, over here, it's morally wrong. We'll, we'll cage you for it. Over here, yeah, you're allowed to do that. You can have that high-capacity magazine. But over here, you're going into a cage for it just by crossing an imagine, imaginary barrier called a state border. And people think that makes sense. They think the moral relativism of man's law makes sense. They actually believe something can be moral in one place and immoral in another place. You know? That's cognitive dissonance. That's holding two contradictory notions in the mind simultaneously and accepting them both when they're clear contradictions with each other. It's called lying to yourself. Let's be honest about what it really is. It's called lying to yourself. Man's law changes with time based upon the whim of legislators, which is also moral relativism. Prohibition in the 1920s. Oh, well, it was legal to possess and consume alcohol. Then for years it became illegal to do so. Then it switched back to becoming magically moral again. We won't cage you for doing it. Well, it changes over time based on our preferences and likes and dislikes. Yeah, we get to make up what law is, what right and wrong are. It's called moral relativism. All right? And it's one of the tenets of Satanism. So what does this mean for the law of man, actually? You know, the people seem to have so much respect for. You know, oh, we're a nation of laws written by men. You know, we don't, we don't give a damn about moral law. We don't really give a damn about what's right and wrong, you know, but we have so much respect for the law of man, which we, people actually believe is somehow based in morality, when it's n nothing of the kind could be further from, it's not, couldn't get any further from the truth than that. It's based in moral relativism, which is about the whims of the legislator in any given time or place. You know, you listen to certain forms of music in certain countries in the Middle East, you could be jailed for years just by putting a certain song on. Imagine this. Now, and we would think that's unacceptable and deplorable. Yeah, we think, you have this 30-round magazine here. This state only allows 10 cartridges to go into a magazine. I bring the physical object, even if it's not loaded with any ammunition, into another state. I can be put in a cage. Physical piece of plastic. You know? It's just total nonsense. Either something's a right, and you're allowed to own it, and you need to be responsible for it, or it's not a right because you're harming somebody. You know, it doesn't get any simpler than that. So what's this all mean for man's law? In light of natural law, what does it mean? To understand natural law, what does that mean for the laws of man here on earth? What it actually means, it's simple if-then logic to apply. If a particular man-made law is in harmony with natural law, then it follows logically that it is redundant. It is stating the obvious. It is stating what is already known. It's like saying, I'm going to write down, yes, during the day, the sky uh, re uh, refracts a blue frequency. And it, it, the sky is blue. I'm going to write that down and make it so. Well, it's redundant. It's self-evident. You can go out in the sky and look at the natural color of the sky on a clear day and, and see what the frequency is with your own eyes. No, you don't need to have it written down. Okay? It's a redundancy. It, so... If it's in harmony already with natural law, it's stating a truth that is already there. It's an inherent truth. It's pre-existing. It's self-evident. Therefore, the writing down of that concept and calling it a law is irrelevant and unnecessary. Now, look, let's look at the opposite. What if something that man writes down as a law is in direct opposition to natural law? So if a particular man-made law is in opposition to natural law, it follows logically that it is both false, meaning that it is incorrect. Okay, that's what natural law is. It's based in truth, that which is. And it's also immoral. Because if it's not based in natural law, it means that it is doing something that is actually harming somebody by taking something from them that doesn't belong to you. Like taxation. Like permits and licensing like suspending rights that do already exist, etc., so forth. All right? So, therefore, it's wrong, and it cannot be legitimately binding upon anyone. You can't write down a wrong and say, this is morally binding upon you, even though it, it, it creates harm, it causes harm, yet you must follow it. 
You know, and people believe this. We asked in the natural law seminar, how many people believe that if a law is passed and it restricts a right that you feel you have naturally because that action that, that it's saying you may not do causes no one else any harm. Do you have any moral obligation to obey that law until you could find a way to get it changed? And o over two-thirds of people said, yes, you have a moral obligation to obey that law because these people are... Are, have the moral right to issue commands and write down laws that constrain you, even if that behavior actually doesn't harm anybody and therefore is a natural right. You would still have to try to find a way to get that law changed. Nonsense. Nonsense. No one can be legitimately bound to a dictate of man that prevents somebody from exercising a natural right. It's called mind control, is what it's called. So in light of the differences between man's law and natural law, in light of natural law, man's law is both irrelevant and unnecessary, as it is either redundant, because it is in harmony with natural law, or it is completely immoral, because it is in direct opposition to natural law. So here's what I see happening. We have a bunch of people, Satanists, practicing Satanists, that are violating moral law, natural law. I mean, violating in an outrageous way. They're killing people. They're molested. They're, if our job is to protect children, we're not doing a very good job. So here's our deal from, from now on. I mean, governmental law and those kind of restrictions you know, it's very important that you follow them or they'll put you in a cage or, or do some kind of violence against you. But if it's, if it's not in harmony with natural law, it's, you've, you've got to obey it kind of like uh, obligingly just to keep yourself out of jail. And sometimes you have to disobey to do the right thing. So here's your job going forward. Abide by natural law. Do the right thing. Regard man-made law or uh, litigation, as was passed by Justice Palfrey, as being, it's in error. It's outside of moral and natural law. It's not in harmony with what is. There was no investigation. It's wrongly accusing people. It's allowing these child torturers to continue. It's protecting the child torturers. So it's violating us. It's violating our natural right to have good, healthy children that create the society. You know, the society is all based around the family and children. And we really need to protect that unit because that's what brings about the next generation of, of moral citizens that are in, in harmony with natural law. So we really need to act uh, against our violation. And we can use force with that. That's in, if you use force against violence, there are two different things. And it's all right to use force. It's all right to take action. You'd want to try to keep yourself out of jail, but you really want to do what's in harmony with moral law. I know that we, Mindy and I try to do this all the time. You know, what's the right thing to do? Not the thing that's mandated by government, but what's the right thing to do in this case? Sometimes it costs us a little money. But we can always go to bed that night and say, well, we did the right thing. We did the right thing. And that's what I'm advising, advising us to do. Use our power as creative human beings. We're a pretty special species in terms of our creativity and our, and our main line touch with the universe. I think we're really unique. So I put together some ideas that maybe things that we could think about doing. I don't want to direct anybody to do anything. I want to applaud the fact that some people are 
taking on the job of investigative reporters and digging into this case, and it'll be exposed before long. It'll be exposed before long. But I had some other ideas, and I'd like to share those ideas with you. Okay, originally, uh, when I was writing this list, I wrote things down, and I numbered them. And then I wrote things in between them. And then this idea launched into that idea. So I don't even know how many ideas I have here. I'm just going to rattle off some things I was thinking of um, that, that are kind of outside the obvious things. You know, the policeman that was interviewed earlier in this segment, in the, in the first segment, talked about voting. That might work in the UK because it's got a slightly different um, parliament than we do. It certainly wouldn't work in the, in the United States because everybody that's elected is either selected by the Committee of 300 or vetted by the Committee of 300 if they're going to have any power. And if they, if they are vetted by the Committee of 300 and they don't, do, and they don't behave correctly like John F. Kennedy, well, they're just, they're just eliminated. So I don't know, maybe in England it would work, but there was a famous uh, woman born into one of these families. It wasn't the Rockefeller or the Rothschild family. I can never remember her name. But she said if voting would change anything, they would make it illegal. And I think that's certainly true in the United States, and I bet you it's true all over most of the world because the people... Unless we would have a landslide of a whole bunch of people who would get in. But how could they do that? Because they don't control the media. So anyway, I'm not sure that voting is going to do anything. Also, uh, Sabine McNeil, if she can, from hiding, is going to try to pursue this case. She's going to try to pin down Judge Palfrey on exactly what what things were taken into account and why she didn't take certain things into account. And she's going to move it along. That might work. I don't think it would work in the United States because even the Supreme Court is totally corrupted and is going to find uh, in favor of whatever the Committee of 300 or the Satanists or whatever you want to call them do. But here's some my ideas. They might be stupid, but, you know, we have creativity on our side. We're we're human beings. First of all, be creative. Think of how we can stop this from happening. Think about how we can stop these people from behaving this way. And you know, it's going to be difficult for them to stop. It's difficult for them to come forward because they're, uh, they can be given money, but also they can be threatened with death or death of the members of their family. Once you get involved with this type of dark evil, it's really hard to break three. But we've got to be creative in terms of coming up with ways that we can uh, skin this banana. Or what's, the, what's the skin this? What is I don't know. Skin the cat. I don't know what it is. Okay, well, <laughs> I don't know what you skin. Yeah, it is. Okay, another thing to do would be to keep investigating this. Now it's being done. There are some really sharp people online. And I encourage you to go to Code 2222 and look at those videos. By It seems to be one person, although uh, the person that's speaking for the UK column seems to think there's a network that are doing this kind of investigation. And, you know, this is so cool because we're using the tools that they're going to use to suppress us against them. We're we're using their Facebook. We're using their surveillance tools to uncover what's going on here. And I think that's remarkable. That's an idea I had. Another thing, I don't know whether you remember from the original story, but McDonald's and what's the coffee place? Starbucks. Starbucks are implicated in this. Their facilities were being used for various functions in turn connected with this. Now, I'm not sure whether McDonald's or Starbucks is run by Satanists. I would imagine if they're making uh, more than a half of $500 million a year, I would imagine they're connected or at least controlled. But it, it would be very easy to to uh, ruin McDonald's 
which is a company that's on the ropes anyway, because people are starting to want actual food that's nutritious. So, so McDonald's is on the ropes anyway. But what we could do is boycott them, at least in the UK, at least in the county where Hampstead is. And this is, this is very difficult for retailers. Retailers only make a tiny percentage, especially if they're corporate retailers, because they have such a huge corporate GNA. So they have, so they work on like three to five percent profit margins. And if you can disrupt them for a month or two months, you could ruin their profit margin for that year. You could actually have them shutting down. Mindy and I actually were involved in a uh, shutting down of a box store in. Um, Vermont, in Brattleboro, Vermont, uh, Home Depot moved in. And the people were really, uh, I mean, we were all liberals at that time. And we were into not the big corporate stores. So we continued to go to our little hardware stores. And they went out of business within a year. They were gone. So it doesn't take much of a ripple to create a big problem for McDonald's and Starbucks to dramatize what's going on, to dramatize the fact that part of their facility was involved in this most horrible of all acts. Um, just an idea. It's a good one. It's a good one? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Also, what you could do is you could raise money and let's say that you had a Starbucks on your block. Well, you could raise money through Indigo and put together another coffee shop and a, an anti-satanic coffee shop or title it some way so that you knew that it was a reaction to us trying to get Starbucks to admit that one of their facilities was involved and to do everything they can. Listen, in the United States, they started a black, black Lives Matter campaign where each of the barristers were told to write something on the cup and try to get into a dialogue on Black Lives Matters. Well, it, fall, it fell apart because everybody initially, well, the barristers wouldn't do it, number one. Number two, researching it, everybody found out that it was a George Soros-type initiative. And the whole Black Matter, Black Lives Matters things is a PR thing by the mainstream to get uh, blacks and whites fighting over the, in the United States. It's you. <laughs> they've used it. Oh my God! They've used it forever, and it still seems to work. It can still seem to to motivate the white people to hate the black people, and vice versa. When they're all Americans. Also, another thing I can remember growing up, we used to have, when I was a teenager, we used to have police radios and fire engine radios so that we could hear when the police were going out on their calls. I don't know whether that still happens anymore. I would imagine it does. I would imagine it's on a frequency that can be monitored. But I would suggest that we do that. Since we know that they're under orders from the Satanists, we should know where they are and what they're doing. They're the enemy. So I think that just monitoring them, I don't know whether it's against the law or not. It, we used to have them, well, everybody that was kind of nerdy and was into that, we used to have it and we could listen to them. We could find out where the fires were and, you know, it was just knowing, knowing what's going on around you. Mm -hmm. Also, I think, here's a good idea, organized neighborhood child protection networks that'll uh, interface with problem families instead of uh, child protection services or the police. I think that they've shown themselves to be on the wrong side of moral law and natural law. So I think we need to take care of those children. That's part of our moral obligation, part of our natural obligation to protect those children and those families. So I know it's it's, it's doing something, but I think that there should be a network of people in every area that monitors these problems and also monitors missing children. We need to get a handle on how big that problem is. 
Nobody, no, na there's no national database that monitors that. You have to see if the local jurisdictions monitor and then roll it up together. So that's something. Now, while I was brainstorming this, two ideas came, jumped into my mind simultaneously. One was the word tribunal, and the other word was the word art, artwork. And I don't know how they exactly fit together. But there have been tribunals that have, uh, like the uh, tribunal that was in Kuala Lumpur, uh, that found that weighed evidence against, uh, I think it was George Bush and probably Tony Blair, for crimes against humanity involving the Iraq War, I believe. There's no reason why those tribunals couldn't be held in private all over the place, especially with the evidence we have on Hampstead, and that that evidence couldn't be put together in a comprehensive uh, manner that could be presented to anybody. Also, I was thinking in terms, maybe on the artwork side, there's no reason why artists in England or all around the world couldn't do artwork, structures, uh, maybe depicting this. I was thinking of maybe uh, those mannequins, only decorated like the bodies of these supposed satan Satanists are supposed to be decorated. You know what I mean? I mean the moles and the piercings. Not so blatantly, but you know, it would have to be done artistically and not in a way, excuse me, that would be uh, harassing people. But we want to bring attention to this problem. And there are tons of artists sitting out there. And I want to make this an assignment. Let's bring this into com public consciousness. Let's make this happen. The other thing is, I think that we're going to find, as I found just doing a little bit of internet, internet research, that Satanists are very closely connected with MI6, CIA, MI5, and the Royals. And those links will become apparent as we delve deeper and deeper into that. And you might even start investigating certain people in the military or in the CIA like Thomas Aquino, uh, who was an open Satanist and a U.S. general involved in all these mind control things. So you can go both ways, and I think you'll meet in the middle. I think you'll find close links, very, very strong links. And when you find them, put them on the web as fast as you can so we can all get them. Oh, that's another thing. When you're on uh, AngerFan or you're on Code 2222 or anywhere else, you find really incriminating evidence that's, that, you can, that you think is really credible, download it. Um, you can get certain programs to download things. Do you know, Mindy, what, which one do we use? Well, for my Mac, I use the iSkySoft Media Converter. And you can download things and just buy a... Uh, we bought some hard drives. Is that what they're called, hard drives? Yeah, backup drives. Backup drives. And just put them on the backup drive because we can use them later um, because I don't know how much longer we're going to have this free of an Internet. And we might be doing things improvisationally later, and we want to have the data. Also, every time I think about things like this, I think that I know that these are crimes against humanity in terms of the Geneva Convention and even before then. And crimes against uh, humanity are such that they are prosecutable by all jurisdictions. So let's say I'm sheriff of Nottingham County, I don't know, in, in the UK. And it's a tiny county and I have three deputies. And I hear about this, this crime against humanity in Hempstead. Or the crime, I mean, there's a lot of them. The CIA admitting torture. That's a crime against humanity. Uh, things that have been shown that Monsanto is doing to uh, living organisms. 
crimes against humanity. You, as a sheriff, have an obligation under these treaties to bring these people to justice. And I always say this, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that all these little municipalities are under control. But you're under the gun on this. This is not, I mean, you're law enforcement, and this is certainly a piece of, of natural moral law. The, uh, the ability to uh, do a, perpetrate a crime against humanity so horrible. And if you're in law enforcement, you're really obligated. Or if you're in charge of a municipality, you're obligated to do something about it. I always want to encourage that. Also, I think another thing that we could do, and this is really dicey, but I think that we should be able to infiltrate and monitor what's going on. Now, I know that's really dangerous. Even putting a monitoring device in somewhere where you know this is going on is really, really dangerous. But you're acting in accordance with moral law. You're doing something that is good. You're not being obedient and and going astray. You are in, in alignment with moral law and ethics. You see, if you work for these guys, if, if you're a Satanist, I'm afraid um, there's really not much we can do because I don't know how you can get out of that belief. I don't know how you can uh, run away from it. I remember, uh, what is his name, the guy who was the head of the Church of Satan. His name was, was it Anton? Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey. His son was born into the Church of Satan, but didn't like it. He had some grasp of natural law. So what happened? Anton LaVey ritually castrated him at the age of 11. So these guys will do anything. So it's really, really risky. But I also want to mention this thing in terms, if you're not a Satanist and you're just following orders on behalf of the Satanists, you're violating natural moral law. The fact that you were ordered to do it, the fact that you were blackmailed into doing it, it doesn't matter. Remember, the second treaty of Satanism is that morals are relative. I mean, it's situational ethics. Anything that feels right, you can do it. You can rationalize everything you're doing. That's not how the universe works. There's right and wrong. And if you're obeying an order and you're protecting child molesters, you're, ch you're protecting child killers, you're a judge that's making judgments and protecting these people, it's not going to wash. It's not going to wash. And you're going to come to a really horrible ending if you're out of sync with natural law. I also think that we have such a wonderful person in Ella Draper and her partner, Abraham. She's gorgeous. She's beautiful. She's intelligent. She's aware. And she's fighting for her children. That's inspiring to me. I remember a couple weeks back, we did a, an expose on Daniel Smith, who's being persecuted by the FDA because he wanted to sell a MMS. He wanted to sell a, a harmless chemical that just happened to cure things like malaria, Ebola, cancer, and, and so forth. But because he's interfering with the profitability of certain pharmaceutical drugs, he's being, well, he could go to jail for 37 years. But the beautiful thing about it is he's an intelligent guy, he's humble, he's sincere, and he's gorgeous. I mean, he really looks like a, just one of us. He's the perfect one to carry this forward. He's the perfect symbol. And I see Ella Draper as the same way. She's a wonderful, beautiful woman who really is clearly intelligent, and she's fighting. She's going to do everything she can do. Let's hope that Putin can keep her out of the 
UK courts. But she's doing everything she can do. And I think we should always point to her and say that we're doing things on behalf of, 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 of the fight that Ella Draper's fighting. Because it's all of our fight. And we have to do it right now. And we have to do it together. You know, I want to play a short clip from uh, a tape made by Abraham Christie, the uh, partner of Ella. He knows. He plans on doing the right thing. And he's, he's given me a very inspiring couple words here. How? How would people like to be remembered when this story is told? in the future. How would these children here now like to be remembered? Will you be remembered as one who, who stood up and refused to accept rape and torture and brutalization and murder of the children? Or will you pretend it didn't happen? Will you make excuses for these demons? Are you one of these demons? How would you like to be remembered? What will you do to be a part of this historic change? Eh? Everybody wants to be part of the story. What part are you going to play? Eh? We already have many characters in the saga. <clears throat> Elisa and Gabriel, the stars of the show, Brave enough, brave enough to speak out fearlessly against the cult who now find themselves once again in the clutches of the very same cult that they have exposed. Please help us. Please assist us so that you may be remembered in the way that you'd wish to be remembered. Do you have any words for our people, ma'am? Definitely, definitely, and um, it's the time to make choice as well on whose side you would like to be in, and uh, whether you want to keep covering up the rape and torturing and uh, sodomizing children, or some, some of the children are born into this cult. And uh, at least Gabriel and Alisa had one, one parent who to turn to, but some children don't. They're trapped into it. Like Millie, James, Yuraj, Sophie, and many, many more. It's our duty to free those children. We cannot live with ourselves while this is happening. And uh, what you mentioned as well earlier about learning this fabric, you know, this fabrication of law, this um, perverting the law, the universal common law, where right is right and wrong is wrong. It's very simple. We all operate on these terms between each other. So why we allow someone else to create some fake, some uh, man-made, man man-made artificial rules and sections and all this? What it is created is only being created to help those uh, those abusers and those criminals, really. There were some criminals, man. Criminals wasn't doing this, man. Yeah, we need to we need to learn what's going on, and it's on our hands to change. It's in our hands to be independent of the system by growing our, our own food for example, so we don't have to support, we don't have to buy in into this uh, death, culture. death culture and support it. How? How would people like to be remembered when the story is told in the future? How would these children here now like to be remembered? Will you be remembered as one who, who stood up and refused to accept rape and torture and brutalization and murder of the children? Or will you pretend it didn't happen? Will you make excuses for these demons? 
Are you one of these demons? How would you like to be remembered? What will you do to be a part of this historic change? Hey, everybody wants to be part of the story. Well, I think that's all. I think that's all I have to say. I think that's all that Abraham has to say, and that's all that Ella has to say. How do you want to be remembered? Do you want to be remembered as somebody who followed orders and facilitated this mess, this this warp of the, the general nature of the universe? Or do you want to be somebody who stood up and stood in natural moral law and did the right thing? Well, that's all I have to say, and that's the end of this World Beyond Belief. Uh, thank you for sticking with us through this whole thing, and uh, let's get together and do stuff. Uh, this is Paul Marco saying goodbye. Goodbye. We'll see you next time.